Hey there friendos, Dubon Kilik here, welcoming you back to another awesome sort of lore theory crafting video, but this time it's not on Zelda. Today we're going to be taking a look at something a little bit different, we're going to be looking at Cult of the Lamb. While playing, I noticed that the first boss's name was Leshy, which was very strange to me. I'd never heard the name Leshy before, except for in a little game called Inscription, which I also fell completely in love with. And you know, that really got Chat and I thinking, who is Leshy? What does that mean? So we looked it up, and as it turns out, the lore is a good bit deeper here than you might anticipate. All of the four or <clears throat> five bishops all have mythologies attached to them. And when you actually look at them, the inspiration is very interesting. However, before we begin, if thine wishes to join the newborn Keelik cult, you have but one simple task. Sacrifice the hell out of that subscribe button. We will be discussing some spoiler material, but if you don't know much about the game, you're probably not going to pick up on what those actual spoilers mean, as I'm not going to be giving a lot of context to the spoilers. Starting off, we have Leshy. Leshy is the first boss and the youngest sibling of the bishops. Notably, he seems to be the embodiment of see no evil, as his eyes were essentially gouged out and he's wearing bandages to cover them. Now I know this whole see no evil thing has been done about a thousand times in video games, but keep it in mind. That sort of mythology and that sort of mantra is going to be all the way through this episode. Leshy shares his name with an Eastern European god of the forest. In Eastern European mythology is a humanoid muscular shapeshifter who sometimes is seen with his family. And he just also has a tendency to abduct children, mainly those children that are cursed, especially by their parents. And also it's kind of a dick because he likes to lead travelers astray. He doesn't say what he does with the travelers, just kind of makes them lost for a little bit and it's mildly inconvenient, which actually goes really well into Leshy's personality as we hear from some of his other bishops in Cult of the Lamb. We learn that he is a chaotic being and Leshy in mythology is generally considered to be a neutral god. Again, this fits with Cult of the Lamb, Leshy, as he's not really evil, he just really enjoys this chaos. Whereas the other bishops all target your followers, Leshy's the only one that completely leaves them alone and only picks a fight with the Lamb himself. It's also a little interesting to note, I guess, that there are no children in Cult of the Lamb. We can actually see the ages of all of the different followers in our cult, and none of them are children. They're all 18 to 50 whenever they grow old and, you know, die and middle of town and make everyone throw up, start a downward spiral, and makes my cult hate me for a day or two. That happened. I mean, aside from obviously not wanting children in the game because that's just weird to be sacrificing children, honestly, this game had enough controversy surrounding it, just being able to lead a cult, being able to sacrifice, you know, the neighborhood kids might be a little bit too far. But still, my headcanon is that Leshy just stole all of them. Interestingly enough, all of the other bishops actually represent one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. However, Leshy doesn't really seem to follow that motif. It's possible that Leshy represents conquest, which is kind of an alternative interpretation to pestilence for the white horsemen. This is kind of reflected in the fact that he actually directly commands one of his minions. The other bishops don't really interact with their followers, except for when they're about to fight and they commit uninstall life. Just a reminder, this is a game about cults. Next up we have Hecate, and if you thought Leshy was terrifying when he was in his eldritch form, a giant frog with two mouths bisecting one another? No, no, <laughs> you don't get to do that. Aside from having probably my favorite standard design in the entire game, look at this frog. It looks like he's got a nice little scarf on, and then you realize it's because his throat was cut open. Speak no evil. It's also heavily theorized that Hecate is supposed to represent the Horseman of Famine, as he will starve your followers, and as I mentioned, this is the first time that we see one of these bishops actually targeting your cult. Leshy left them alone, so I think we're entering a little bit more into evil territory. Your cult followers are toys, pawns for them to use in the battle, whereas with Leshy, they were not. Hecate actually shares a name with the Egyptian goddess for fertility, which is ironic because it starves your followers and people pray to them so that they don't have like bad crops and stuff. So it kind of makes sense, but at the same time, it's uh, eh, it's a little less of, you know, like a concrete sort of connection, but it's still interesting. I mean, you know, the whole uh, famine and uh, fertility sort of thing. It's almost like an, an opposite 
heck it. Like if you're a follower, you know, they'll be great to you and they'll, you know, give you great crops and you'll you'll have a bountiful harvest. However, if you don't, you're going to be famined. All right, you will starve. Her frog form also sort of brings her a little bit closer to this Hecate deity. But again, it's super ironic that Hecate is associated with fertility. And the Cult of the Lamb Hecate is just all about that famine. It's also through Hecate that we can learn that the one who waits was the one that caused all of these bishops their mortal injuries in the first place. She states as following. It was not so long ago that we cast out the red crown, a mere thousand or so years. The heresy it preached could not be tolerated. Such noxious ideals, it could not be allowed. And with greed and ambition unchecked, it drew godly blood. Clearly, when they say the red crown drew godly blood, it's most likely meaning that they hurt their own family. So yeah, maybe that person that brought us back to life wasn't that nice after all. I mean, look at that cat. And it is confirmed to be a cat, by the way. Kalamar is the hear no evil. This is pretty obvious. His ears are essentially torn off. He's also heavily associated with the Horseman of Pestilence, as he will make your followers sick, which is one of the more difficult things to deal with in the game. On the third encounter in Anchor Deep, where he resides, he actually shows that he's very scared of the Lamb and the Red Crown. He states as following, it seems you cannot be stopped by disease or hunger, and he sends you back from death stronger each time. Please know, it was not my idea to cast out the Red Crown, the other bishops, my siblings. The blame lies with them. Please, I beg of you, spare me. Kill Shamura, but do not send me to death. Do not send me to him. You will not find my temple. I will be safe there. Yes, I will be safe. This is a stark contrast to the rest of the bishops who are actually very confident and very cocky. However, Kalamar is one of the most difficult fights in the game. And this is where my thoughts kind of differ from popular opinion. The first time I read Kalamar, I read Kalima. And I was like, oh, like Kali. Like, I, don't, I just have that old meme stuck in my head, the Kalima. <laughs> but notice that Kalamar actually wields multiple weapons at once, a lot like what we see with Kali the Hindu goddess of destruction, and like everything else. It's like the ultimate god there, and she's just completely incredible. The wiki's convinced that Kalamar is just a play on the word calamari, which hilarious, first off, but also Kali, multiple weapons. That's my headcanon right now. Next, we have Shimura, and clearly, this is Think No Evil, obviously. They are generally seen to be the apocalypse rider of war, because spoiler alerts, skip forward about 10 seconds, they make you fight your own followers. Oddly enough, I couldn't actually find a god that had a parallel with Shimura, such as we've seen with the previous bishops. But I have a strange feeling that that only means that this person is far more significant to this story in Cult of the Lamb. Shimura is also the only one who calls the one who waits by his actual name. Narinder. And this is interesting later because as we'll find out, Shimura and the one who waits were actually a lot closer than they were with the other siblings, the other bishops. So much to the point that the one who waits actually shows a little bit of remorse for Shimura's death. In the post-game dialogue with the one who waits, Shimura is the only one that he even looks at a little bit fondly. To the point where he says, Did Shimura weep when you killed them? Did they know it was their end? Once they were the brightest of us, their mind gracious and strong like a spider's silk that encased their home. It reminds me of them. So clearly the one who waits and Shimura were quite close. And finally we come to the one who waits, Narinder. This one is believed to be the aspect of do no evil as he has done the evil and has been locked up for it. Also, potentially the Horseman of Death. But going any further into this specific character would lead into a lot of spoilers that I don't want myself or to push upon you. Anyway, with that, that is all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching all the way to the end. It does help me out an awful lot. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Thank you so much to my patrons, Twitch members, channel supporters. I'm your one Keelik, and I will see you in the next one. I'm out.